Has everyone got a chair? Okay, guys and girls, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to my fourth, is it? Meetup? I don't know, something like that. Um, <coughs> wow, we're quite busy, aren't we? Um, got a good um, lineup tonight. There's no red budget speakers, which is great. <laughs> so, um, and we'll keep it that way as much as possible. So, um, like for future meetups and stuff, please, please, please volunteer to talk. Um, I know there's lots of exciting things going on with React at the moment. We've got an exciting project that's um, being released soon, so we can talk about that as well, which would be great, so we might do that next time. Um, so, yeah, a few things have happened. We've got 301 members now, which is great. So just hit the 300 mark. I don't know who the 300 was, so they don't get a bottle of champagne. Um, and, um, yeah, so tonight we've got um, Jamie, who runs the Ember Meetup, and um, Jamie and I have had a little reciprocal arrangement, so I went and talked to over there, and he's going to talk here, which is great. Um, because we think that there's lots of benefit in um, learning different frameworks and seeing what other people are doing and seeing what we can, how we can join together. And, you know, what, there's always, even if you never use a different framework, there's always like benefit in knowing it and understanding it. And it gives us a different perspective on what we do, which is brilliant. Um, so Jamie's going to go first, then Rob's going to talk about diffing algorithms in, in React. And then Marcus is going to finish up with a presentation that he did recently, which looks really good. Um, at the end, so um, we might take a break in, in between either one and two or two and three, depending on see how it goes. But um, I hope you've all had lots of beer. So, um, and should we get started? It's good. Okay, so um, yeah, when we we'll have to switch laptops and stuff, so um, very organized, really. But Sorry, can I just yeah, yeah, the. the Passwords on the board at the back there. So the, the SSID is Red Badger, and that's the password on the. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can everybody hear? All right. <laughs> but yeah, I might completely put back in again. Should I do something with the remote? HDMI one. There we go. There we go. Okay, good evening, hello everyone. Um, thanks to Stuart for letting me come and talk and thank you again for coming to talk at ours. Um, when Stuart came to talk at Ember London, uh, was it last month or the month before? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it piqued a lot of people's interest. So um, the React, uh, sorry, the Ember London has been running for, or we've been, Ember London has been running for a fair old while, maybe two years, something like that. Um, I've been helping run it for getting on for a year and um, it's had a steady build in interest, but it's, it's kind of as nothing compared to how React has taken off in the community. It's, it's kind of galling to see how big your numbers are already, given how young you are. But like I say, it piques a lot of people's interest and I think there's a lot to learn from both frameworks. So um, this is me, my name's Jamie. I work here. Like I say, I help organize this. And I co-wrote this. If anyone's interested in learning Ember, you can get that. So I wanted to start with this quote that I read recently in this book. And I think it really applies to all of us. So, so our hard problem, our shared hard problem, is building rich user interfaces in the browser, given the tools that we have today, rather than, you know, I think the standards bodies are doing amazing work looking towards the future of what, what sort of a platform the browser will be. But I'm talking about building, building apps in the browser today. And our many good minds are, are all these people. And um, I've, I've not, we've all, none of us got that much time. So I decided to focus on these two. I've been familiar with Ember for a couple of years now and I really enjoy using it. And I really enjoy building things in it. 
but I know that there are things to learn from React and vice versa. So what I would hope is that any time you learn a framework, you can take the mental models from it and when you start a new project, you can, you can apply them even if you're not using that framework. And there's quite a lot of crossover already between Ember and React. So um, Ryan Florence is the author of React Router and a number of really interesting Ember libraries. And he's been kind of this, this interesting pivot point around the two communities. He's quite, um, he's quite terse on Twitter, so it gets a bit flame warry, but he's con contributed lo uh, loads to both. And like generally his message is positive that he's brought ideas from both to each other. Uh, Eric Brin is on the Ember core team and he has nothing but good things to say about Pete Hunt and the rest of the React core team. And Tom Dale, who's one of the Ember authors, has the, the odd friendly, friendly tussle with Pete Hunt on Twitter. So in short, there's no love lost between these two. And um, like I can say, I want to use them both in spirit, if not practically. So I had some really grand ambitions for this talk. What I wanted to do was build a sort of JS bin type browser application one made in Ember tailored to building Ember apps or sort of testing Ember apps or getting the feel for working with Ember and another built in React for the same purpose, but for React. And full disclosure, I built one of these before for Ember, probably about a year ago. And it was useful because for the iframe over on the right that contains the running code, to do it efficiently, like to re-render, to tear down the app and rebuild it efficiently, you need to know something about how each framework does that like its life cycle. So I found doing that really informative with Ember and it seemed like an interesting case for React as well, given, given how React works, the idea that you could have a DOM sort of reapply the function that is your app and not need to really tear anything down. You could just let React loose on the DOM that's already there. So um, first bootstrapping these two applications. So can I just get a show of hands who's used Ember to any extent? So that's about, I don't know, 20%, 30%. Who's used Ember CLI? So that's five or six. So starting an Ember project these days, a sort of ambitious one rather than, rather than a toy project looks like this. You install the Ember CLI command line tool, you new up a new Ember app, and that's going to make a load of decisions for you. And um, you might find this antagonizing, or you might find it, um, reassuring or a mixture of both. But I think the thing to bear in mind with this, this kind of scaffolding is these decisions aren't just made by one, you know, one guy in an ivory tower. This is the whole community contributing to these best practices and they will change and they will keep with the times. So personally, I find them reassuring. Um, but you can just install Ember just as a standalone library and just use it and just incorporate it into your existing tooling. On the React side of things, now, I'm sure that there are Yeoman generators and things like that for React, but I was, um, I was kind of going off of, I wanted to learn React the same way that I learned Ember, which is just by futzing around and trying to find my way through it. Um, and because the, the only thing that the docs really mentioned was Browserify, I figured I'd just sort of use a build tool that I knew and incorporate Browserify and kind of do it as they suggested. So, um, Browserify is really nice to, to work with. And Ember CLI doesn't work with Browserify, but there's work going on to make that happen. Because I think everyone realizes what, what an, a nice way to operate that is. And on that note, I should add that um, React is obviously shipped on NPM. Angular, as of late, is shipped on NPM. And Ember is about to be as well. So it's, um, it's interesting that it's gone that way, but I think it's definitely the cleanest way anyone's come up with of, sh of shipping these packages. So um, I've seen a lot of people use Gulp for React. I don't know Gulp particularly well. I didn't really want to learn Gulp alongside learning React. So I chose to use Broccoli, which I know quite well. So the stuff in my package JSON, the stuff in my Bower JSON. So for that, that editor in the middle pane, I just figured I'd use Ace as a known quantity. It's an editor that works pretty well in GitHub use it so it can't be too bad um, and i wanted the project structure to be familiar to what ember cli generates so there wasn't too much 
kind of context switching as I was jumping between the two. So this is vaguely what my, my project looked like. So a, an app JSX that bootstraps the whole thing and then everything else would be a, some, some component in there. And then obviously the, the back and everything else. So I thought I'd just walk you through with my um, broccoli brock file. So who's used broccoli? Another show of hands. So that looks like one, two, three, four, four or five. Okay, so the way broccoli works, as opposed to gulp where you pipe, you pipe your build chain together, in broccoli the idea is taking a tree or numerous trees of files and transforming them into other trees with different functions. So the simplest tree is just a path to a directory. So I take the app directory. I have a, a broccoli filter called Reactify, which is just a, kind of a wrap around the React tooling. So it'll turn JSX files into JS files. So what that's going to do is give me a new tree with every JSX file turned into a JS file, and then I can pass that on and transform it into others. So then I pass that into a browserify tree, which is going to produce a new tree, which just contains this one file here. Um, pick files is a really simple one where you just give it a tree and it'll just pick whichever files you want out of it and put them somewhere different in the resulting tree. So that was just my way to get my index HTML out. Same for the style sheet. And then I don't know if anyone's used ACE, but the way ACE, the way ACE loads in its modes and themes and, um, it does syntax highlighting using web workers. So, um, it loads in its bits and bits of files dynamically when you need them. It didn't really make sense to compile it down and ship the whole thing in one big blob. It made more sense just to bring its separate packages in and sit them in the assets directory. So this is what this is doing. It's just saying, grab grab that directory out of Bower components and then put it in assets ace in the resultant file. So one of the things Broccoli is going to do is watch for changes in all your trees so that it can watch for the points at which it should invalidate a branch of the tree and allow that to rebuild. Unwatch tree means we never expect this to change because it's in Bower components. Like you might, you might install an upgrade to that component along the way, but probably you restart. Uh, public is just a plain old directory and we don't want it to move anywhere. So we just leave it as is. And then I wanted to share a style sheet between the two. So I've got a, a common common assets directory, which is just outside of both, and it's going to get brought in. And then merge all those trees together. So kind of like take all those directories and just like put them into one and export that as the output directory. And that's what Broccoli is going to like put in your build directory, which will end up looking something like this. Um, so sandbox, sandbox base is the common style sheet. So, um, Broccoli comes with a, a server as well, so that it will watch your files and do incremental rebuilds. And it, because it has this tree concept, it can it's smart about if you change one file, it knows to invalidate just that branch and this kind of thing. Um, this is what um, this is what the build tree for Ember CLI looks like in comparison. So I wanted to keep them fairly similar. Again, Ember CLI has made more decisions, so. Um, Ember CLI comes with your testing directory set up and your test harness, decisions about cross domain XML. And you know, like using a Yeoman generator, it's the scaffolding for an app that you can you could deploy to production, you know, as soon as you put some logic in it. But broadly it's similar. It's sandbox.js contains all of the app logic, vendor.js contains all the vendor files, likewise with the two CSS files and then the common one. So um, I want to start with the sort of the bootstrapping process or like the, the root most component for both, for both frameworks. So this is, this is what it looks like in Ember. So all you have to do to boot an Ember app is say Ember application create, and then it's going to use this application template as like that, that will by default take over the entire body of the DOM and, um, render your child roots into it. But this is what my application template looks like. So the markup isn't terribly important. I've got a browser pane, which is the one on the far left with the files in it. You'll see there's an each loop here, which is looping through each file that I've provided to work on and they've come from somewhere. Um, and then it's going to link to name is the label. So that's imagine, imagine if it was like each file in files, it would be file.name. File is the name of the 
the root which will help which will like render that file and this is the file so within that each loop the context on each iteration around is is this moving on down i've got a pane in the middle with an outlet in it and um this is ember's router at work so the idea is when i click on one of those files the url changes to that particular file and you're going to go into the file route and that template is going to get rendered into that outlet right there because it's the child of the application. And then down at the bottom, I've got the viewer, which is the thing on the right, which is going to take a bundle of code. So it's an iframe. So it'll like, what I want to do is post message into that iframe with a bundle of code, which that iframe has something that can handle that reload and like rebuild the Ember app. In comparison, my React app, so I, I'm going to start to sort of unravel my talk at this point by admitting that I haven't finished it. So I, um, I realized I wasn't going to finish it last week and I figured that what might be quite a nice way to avoid just a very dry ramble onto the end would be to involve all of you in, in kind of helping me bust on forward with the React app. So I was trying to pick up React and that was very simple to do, like to pick up the primitives was very easy. But to pick up the idioms of React seems to require more reading, like more engaging with the community, more forums, more Stack Overflow, more Twitter, more IRC, all of that kind of immersion in what the right way to build a React app is. So in Stuart's talk, he talked about trying not to use state on child components as much as humanly possible and said use props for the thing to be referentially transparent like it's supposed to be. Um, and that is a good concept to have in mind, but I wasn't quite sure what the patterns looked like to apply it. But anyway, so this is my root app component. So I'm going to get some files from somewhere, compile them into the app somehow, and then something that renders the, just like in my Ember app, but without the each, it's going to render the, the link for each file on the left. Um, and then I've got my main markup, which is identical to the Ember one, except of course, instead of the each, it's just going to map through those. Um, I'm using React Router, so Active Root Handler is the, the equivalent of Outlet, of, of course, with the file, with the prop explicitly passed into it, and then uh, some sort of viewer as well on this side of things. So um, I want to talk about routing and compare these two for a bit. So this is what routing looks like in Ember. Um, this is, it's kind of inherits a little bit from Rails and other places. So what this is saying, like the important part is this. It's saying there's an application route which you get for free and a route means it's like the template that you enter into and you render. And it's also going to know how to grab files for you or grab model data for you to load into that template. And then within my application, I've got a file route which has this kind of globbing splat path. So it can take any like any path after that it's going to understand is like the, the ID of the file. And then this is the root which handles that file. So imagine landing on a URL such as um, app.js. params.file ID there is going to be app.js. So it's just going to say, it's going to look up into its parent root, the application, and say, um, what are the files that are loaded in? Find me the one whose name matches this, and then if there is a file, we're going to return it as the model. So this is the, the model hook whose job is, it's a bit like get initial state. It's just going to return the thing to render. Otherwise, we've basically got 404 and go back to the index. And serialize down there means if we've already got a model, how do we turn it into a URL? So that's that's what that's doing there. So you, you remember this dot resource. Um, path equals splat file ID. Well, it needs to know what splat file ID, what file ID, the file ID part of that is. And this is what Serialize is doing. It's just saying, this is, this is what goes into the URL. React Router, on the other hand, um, actually, just another quick show of hands, who's used that? Who's used React Router? Okay, that looks like five or so as well. So this is kind of, this is um, Ryan Florence's work based on Ember's Router in various ways but also i think he's aimed to make the like make the best of react um 
but in conceit it's similar so at the top level there's the application route that's going to render its component and then the, the file route which is going to render a file component or an instance of the file component rather and again we're using a splat path the i noticed that the um the splatting support it's just splat you, you don't get to name it it's just splat in react router and then this is my file component for react so um this is the point at which I don't know whether I'm writing idiomatic React or not. We'll go a bit further. And then what I want to do is invite everyone to help me improve this. So, so far, um, I sort of took the way I'm familiar with working in Ember, but also the notion that things should be referentially transparent and I don't want two-way bindings and I just want data flowing down into the virtual DOM. Um, so I passed in the files as a prop and the file ID is coming in a splat. So I'm doing the same kind of thing where I'm like looking through this array of files to find the one that I'm supposed to be rendering. And again, if I found one, I'm going to return as the, uh, the rendered version of this component an ace editor component, which I'll show you in a sec, with the value set to the value prop set to the file value and the mode set to a mode, which I've inferred from the file extension. And I think it makes sense to um, figure out the file extension here. I don't think ace editor needs to know about that. I figure that my, my file root should infer things about the file and then just tell ace editor what it's found out and of course, and like render it just a, like a, a default if we haven't got a file. So onto the ace editor component and this is where things, so this is this part and this is where things run out. So this is the point at which I show you where I've got to so far. So, okay, so let's go for my React app. Um, okay, cool. Oh, by the way, um, I'm using, uh, This Reactify is a package called um, Broccoli React, but it doesn't know how to do the same kind of caching that Watchify can do yet. And I know that there's Gulp, Gulp Watchify or something like that. So it's totally plausible to do it, to adapt Broccoli React to do the proper kind of caching, maybe lean on Watchify or maybe just kind of implement the same ideas. But it, I thought it was nice that there's a real opportunity to contribute to open source right, right there. Um, so rebuilds aren't quite as fast as they ought to be, but I'll learn to live with that. So um, I'll show you side by side the two, the two components, the way I've written them. And they're not that different. So on the one side, so the React Ace editor on the left, the Ember Ace editor on the right. So let's step through these a little bit and see what see how they're similar. So this is written in uh, ES6 module syntax. It's not using ES next or anything like that. It's just, just the module syntax. And of course the um, common, common JS uh, module syntax on the left. But let's ignore that and just focus on what these two things export. So I figure these look pretty similar. Uh, we don't need to render in Ember because there is a um, a template to go along with it. The template handles what you would, what extra um, elements you would render into the DOM if you need to. Otherwise, it's just it will sort of render itself as an element. And because we want we want to just like get an element in there and then let Ace Editor bind onto it and populate it with all the all the stuff or Ace Editor's elements. I figure it's best to just leave it as kind of an empty element to bind onto. So that's fairly similar. Then you've got this. Um, so Ember has basically exactly the same hooks that React does. So um, component did mount is echoed by this did insert element over on the over on the right. So you'll see did insert element here, and you could equally write whoop, you could write this function, this method rather. You could write it that way and then they basically look exactly the same. It's just a life cycle hook for this, this component. Um, and then I'm grabbing the, 
the, this .get element here, this .get DOM node there looks exactly the same, uh, booting up Ace Editor, giving it that element, um, just setting some like options on Ace Editor, and then doing the messy work of binding to the Ace Editor's events so that we can encapsulate them inside of this component. And in um, I didn't realize at first that the, uh, the methods of a, of a React component are automatically scoped to it. Um, <laughs> So I found it nice that all I, all I need to do is this dot handle editor change, and that's that's fine. It's not going to lose its context. In Ember, I would need to do that. In fact, I haven't even bothered giving an extra handler. I've just done it in line there. And then um, this is where things differ. So over on the left in, in React land, I want to um, force the, the editor itself to update and to behave in the same way it would if I, if I was just receiving a component update lifecycle hook. So not, um, it's not going to trigger a re-render because it's the same, same div I'm returning, and that's fine. But I do know that values have changed. So all, all I want to do is call these, these, kinda, these methods that do the right thing on the ace editor. So if, um, if my theme prop changes, I'm going to change the theme, if the mode prop changes, and if the value prop changes, and et cetera. Um, so I'm calling these manually every time component did update happens. Whereas over in Emberland, set that back as it was. So um, I'm not calling this manually anywhere, but it's basically exactly the same method. Instead, I've um, annotated it with dot observes editor and theme. So this is saying anytime the editor property of this component changes or the theme property changes, just run this function. And it's just going to check that both things exist and then set the theme on the ace editor. Update mode does exactly the same thing. An update value does a little bit more just because um, you don't want to get into a, when you, when you call this set value on ace editor, it's going to immediately fire its uh, on change event, which makes sense, but obviously you'd end up in a cycle, where right? you set value, receive the new value, and then try and set it again, and then get into an infinite loop. So I just want to make sure that if nothing's changed, I don't need to do anything with the editor. And this is going to get run. Update value is going to get run whenever the editor property gets set on this component. So just like with React, if this dot props, you know, dot, uh, dot value changes, this function will get run, except that I'm not, um, I get the advantage that I can also set it on myself, if you see what I mean. So the act of setting this dot value here is going to, it's going to trigger this bit of things. And it's also going to notify anyone else who's watching the value of this component. So, um, so that's what those both looks like, both look like. Now, in Ember, I'll just show you how that ends up rendering. Oops. So this is my React sandbox. And actually, I'll tell you what, I'll, um, I'll boot this on a different port, so I can have both side by side. So that's my React sandbox, and notice the, the URL updating, and this will now be the Ember one I expect, yep. Um, file names are a bit longer. But you get the gist, same, like, exact same application. Now, in the Ember app, because Ember, Ember's onus is on property bindings, creating this, this kind of almost FRP-type model where you never you never manually propagate um, any changes. You just set values on objects, and it's given that Ember will take care of propagating that change out anywhere it needs to go. Whereas, as I understand it in React, um, I didn't look too hard into the flux pattern because I was hoping to gleam as much as I needed from React docs. But as I understand it, mutating data should happen outside of React, somewhere above, and then let it flow down again. So 
the question I have for all of you is in my Ember editor, all right, if I change one of these files, then it's, it's literally changed the instance in memory and bindings have just taken care of that for me. There's nowhere where I really directly write, you know, find this object and set its, its uh, value. Whereas in the, uh, in the React sandbox, what I want to know is, so let me walk you through my thinking here and tell me where I've got it wrong and what, should I, what I should do instead. So let's have a look at my um, file route. So I'm assuming that what I want to do, let's just break this onto a few more lines. So I want a editor to work like an input would and have an on-change event for me to handle the on-change event. Now, when I receive that, I was thinking, do I just pass it on up to the app? Like, that's what you'd do. What would everyone do? Would you just take that change event and let it flow back up to the very top of things so that state is only stored in one place? Yeah. So if I were to just, um, I don't know, like check that there, that there is a handler. And then, oh, sorry, oops. And what would you, what would you typically pass into it? Would you, um, let's see, so if I go back to the app, so right now, all I've got is these are just, this is just some like dummy data. So I've got an array of files, which I want to sort of enter the React app and I'm just using those as my get initial state, but I only want state in at the very top. And I, I didn't want to introduce something else outside which managed state. I figured it was cool to let the, the app, just that one app component handle all the state. Um, so I'm using them here and I'm passing them in uh, here. Oops. Right. So I'm passing them into that files route there. So it, no so it knows what array of files it can deal with. Um, but would I want to like add an, a handle change, like an on change handler to this child route? Yeah. yeah. So let's see how you're supposed to do that with the React router. Actually, I figure it's just a prop, isn't it? So presumably on change can be just this dot handle change. So I should say that this talk is kind of like, it was meant to be a talk where I'd done all this and figured it all out and I impressed you with my knowledge. Instead, I'm a terrible person and I'm getting you to help me finish my talk. Think of it like group therapy. So if I've got handle change here, right up at the top, and what I want to do is get a change from my file uh, root or file component and then apply it to that state. So I ideally want to be calling set state up here, I assume. Is that a reasonable thing to be saying? Yeah. All right. So, so you've got the ace editor. And right now it's just, oops, uh, let's save that. Got the ace editor down at the bottom and it's just calling on change and it's not saying anything else it's setting its value property because i assumed you'd want to be able to like reach into the editor and get the value off of it so that you can then pass it on up or do something with it and then i figured it would be kind of the same on the app component so here so at this point at the top handling a change event so some changes come up from from down in the tree somewhere. Would you, who would expect some kind of value to come up here that I can use? Two values. Two values. File name and value. Okay, so the file name rather than the file object. Yeah, the ID because you yeah. can only treat the file itself as, I, as a usable. Okay. Okay, so. So it's a like file ID. <laughs> yeah, so, so the file ID comes up and then the value, the new value that's going to be applied to it. Okay, so let's make sure that that happens here. So 
in this case, we're receiving just the, let's say we're just receiving the value from Ace Editor, the new value, or, or I guess we could look it up. Um, so let's say I'm going to receive it. So I just want to call, oops. Um, I guess it's just, it's this same thing, isn't it? It's the file ID will just be that same prop that's come in. And then that value. And I'm just going to make sure that my ace editor definitely does pass the value up. It doesn't right now. So. Okay, so. So now up here. I should be getting out. That's not alert. That, that's crazy. Excuse me if I type things a bit clumsy. I've got a uh, recently broken hand. Um, all right. So at this point, hopefully, once I've once I've made all the bugs come out. Um, okay. Cool. So. Um, I think I just logged the value. I meant to log both things. Did I fail to log the file ID there? I think I might have. Oh yeah, there is. Yep, absolutely. Okay, cool. So next step would be to create a new version of that initial state and then set it over the top. You reckon? You have a couple of choices. You you could communicate with the bit inside state. There's the, there's the update add-ons, the immutability tables in React add-ons. Okay. Gives you kind of like a almost like a Mongo style syntax yeah. like dollar set. So you can reach right in and value. Yeah. And then that is kind of I can't remember the I can't remember the inner details, but okay. essentially trying to do copy on line to sort of communicate in code so that you're gotcha. intelligently updating it rather than updating something hidden inside that React doesn't know what's changed. Yeah. But both would work. One is just more efficient than the other. Yeah, and I guess presumably I could use something like um some sort of persistent data structure library as well and like keep the files in that yeah. or something so that it's like more, is it more, more yeah, yeah David Nolan's one okay well I guess the cheapest thing to do right now is uh I've got some files already that's my state so I'm just going to do the um you can map them which would give you a new array of two thousand things immutable so you can map them and turn the same file for anything that you're not changing mm -hmm. you can turn a fresh file so my new, say like new, um, hang on, so let me just get the syntax of this dot set state, right? So is this, this dot set state is setting a whole new state object. It's not like a targeted update to the state. You can pass in just the properties that change, mm -hmm. but it will, behind the scenes, it will copy the old state object and merge in the changes. Okay, cool. So you could, yeah. this file is an object in an array. Isn't it? It's an array. So it's just this simple array of objects here. Be more useful if you repeat it by name and store it in an object. Yeah. So I'm gonna. I'm just gonna do it. The. Um, I'm mean, gonna just copy over some bits of code from the file helper for the moment, just to. Just so we can like keep this conversation going. Um, by the way, tell me when my time's up. So I'll just like. Can I do that? Um, I quite li like the idea of mapping it into a new array, or I could just, I don't know, um, files equals this dot. Hey. Okay, cool. Um, and then I can just say file dot value equals value. And then this dot set state files, files, something like that. that isn't terribly good idea, though, because you're mutating. The, the, the thing with React is that you shouldn't mutate states directly. Mm -hmm. You should only do it by calling set state. Yeah. Um, and what will happen if you do that? Well, it will work. I think it might give you a warning. I'm not sure. Uh, might not do. Uh, but you will discover that if you want to write a special component or something like that, so that actually your new state and your old state suddenly so magically look the same. Yeah. Oh, right, of course. Okay, so this this is kind of what I was hoping is I could just sort of hack this in order to 
But if we map it, then it really will be. Do you just want to do in, in place on the end of the bar file because this will take up files? You want to do a map of the thing that says, yep. if trial on AD subscribe ID was done this, I've got the original. Sounds good. All right. So, but if you know, if you just use the method instead, this has to here's the file map, yeah, that would be, that'd be the simplest. If it was an object, if files was an object, I was going to do it. Yeah. I, do, I agree. I agree, except that I think it will take me longer to change that data structure and then deal with the ramifications further down. Maybe it won't. React will just do the right thing. It's actually set it by the file name. If it was an object. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go with the, the map approach just, just to begin with. So, um, Uh, <laughs> so if file.name is file ID, then we want to return a new version of it. Um, um, not that, that. That's why it's just returning the old objects. Just it executes the, the cheap version of a, a merge. And um, that look all right? Yeah. All right. I mean, I'm not saying this is what anyone would write in an application, but just to get us to the right point. And then, so set state should cause things to re render at that point. Oop. So it's doing something. <laughs> So I think what's happening there is I'm probably getting to the point of um, it's just here. When the value changes, it's moving the cursor back up to the top, which I don't really want. Are you thinking of, uh, also, if a center is actually manually handling the, the event and changing this, changing its inner like how it's rendering. Yeah. In, in like say it was a normal input rather than a center. Yeah. Then React would be kind of essentially stopping that input from changing because the state would be part of what the value of the input. Whereas in this situation, a editor is told, I don't know, I've never used it, but if a editor is doing anything itself to actually insert that character in the in the editor and do anything, and then you've got React trying to do exactly the same thing again, uh -huh. you've kind of got a double situation that I don't know. I'm, I'm that sounds realistic. Although I assume that the the virtual DOM. It works in any so in this case, you probably want to check whether the value is already the value you're about to send yeah. it to and then just skip that whole code. Yeah, yeah sounds because otherwise send code mirror if you override the value it will reset the cursor position even if you haven't actually changed anything. All right so um we want to check that it's not already the value that's in no. oh sorry yeah <laughs> That seems good. So the question is, will this, will it, will we keep these changes? Yay. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna, I think I'll leave it at that point because that was really, really instructive to me. I, I figured this was the way to send the changes all the way up to the top and not try, because in, in Ember, that file route would have a certain authority over the model it's been given. Like it would be, it would kind of be permitted to do world-changing things with it, at least in, in the scope of the file. But I, I figure that if you do that in React, you lose referential transparency, you, like you lose that, the, the biggest gain. So um, I think the general idea is that you put the, you put the data or the state as high as it needs to be so yeah. it can get to wherever it needs to be. So like, if you've got like three different components that are dealing with the same piece of data, then you need to put it one above that. Yes, so right. You put it as high as it needs to be for anything else to handle it. Yeah. So if you've got something low down, it's just dealing with some data on its own, then that can just be down there mm -hmm. on its own. But yeah. Cool. Yeah. So in this case, the things that need to know about those files are the editor, the file list, and the the viewer on the right, the iframe. How does this work though? Once you get a, a, a constant, so this works quite happily for this size of application. But once you get start getting something like that, maybe maybe let's say you're writing Gmail or something. And you have a lot of services, 
going on, a lot of cross-cutting concerns, and a lot of you guys always like, oh, click this one, do this over here, that piece of thing will need to change in some way. My worry is that oh, that's where flux that's comes in. Yeah. <laughs> that's where flux comes in. Because you, you get tired uh, of, of passing the on-chain camera all the way down and then crawling back up instead of just holding this battery up top and it will trick in the ground. Uh, where it needs to be. Sure the handle to go over the Okay. Like a puff sub thing sitting at the top that and everyone tells this changed, and whoever is interested in that listens and says it's a change. Cool. And React has some notion of batching of changes anyway, right? Okay, cool. All right, well, like I say, um, I intended to come here and demonstrate that I'd learned both frameworks and figured out the figured out the crossovers and figured out the differences. And I think comparing how you write a component, like something like a, a very self-contained ace editor component, illustrates that they do have a lot in common. And the fact that the Ember router translates into React quite well is, is interesting too. And it's especially interesting that it translates into um, that it translates into JSX nicely as well is is surprising and cool and interesting and and sort of implies that this is a very dynamic way to describe applications rather than just DOM. Um, so I'll leave it there. But really, like, thanks so much to everyone who helped me out. Um, I owe you all a beer. So, cheers. Yeah, let's have a beer for five minutes.
Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Rob Knight. I work at Mendeley and actually for a living and for, for most of my time I've been working on native apps. So whereas I guess a lot of you, um, Jamie, Jamie was coming from a different web framework and many of you may be coming from websites and making them richer and more like client apps. I'm on the other hand kind of going, coming from a world of native apps where things like components have existed around for a long time and looking to you know see what we can, how much of that we can now implement in the browser. Um, and what piqued my interest in React is a lot of the new web component stuff works in a similar sort of way to traditional component to traditional native app frameworks I'm familiar with. React, on the other hand, has a few things about it that make it quite different. That make you know, that that made me think, you know, I'm going to learn something here. Um, so there's a number of parts of React that make it interesting, that make it different from other things, and one of them is the virtual DOM and how it updates itself. So when you have uh, the structure of a React app, you have a tree of components in your app. And from that, React creates a DOM tree. So here's a trivial app. I got fed up of to-do apps. So this is a slight variation of a meetup app. And in the lower left corner, we have our tree of React components. So there's a top level app. There's a tab bar. There's one view that shows details of the current meetup and one that shows a list of the next meetup. From that, uh, React needs to produce a DOM tree. And the question is, when, you, when I click on another tab, for example, um, the app, our component tree will get re-rendered and React then needs to generate the new DOM tree. And the process of doing that is called reconciliation. So originally I called this talk diffing and on the website, the word diff is mentioned once or twice. But if you read any of the React source code, they refer to the process as, as re reconciliation. So this is about what happens when you call set state or set props on a component. How does the render process work and how does it happen efficiently? So supposing I click on a, uh, another tab, we need to, we need to, the, uh, we'll, we want to update the contents of the app. Um, so supposing you click on another tab, the details view gets replaced with a list view. 
and um, we'll, our, our top level render function will be called and we'll, we'll render a new component tree. And then what React has to do is somehow produce that second DOM tree as efficiently as possible. Um, so the question is, how can we do it efficiently? One option is just to re throw everything away that's currently in the DOM tree and recreate the entire thing. Uh, and it's important that whatever you do with that application, React will give the same result as if you did that. Um, so recreating the entire tree is a slow, will be a slow process. Um, so what we want to do instead is compare the old and the new trees and find a smart way to effectively to produce a list of edits that take us from the old DOM tree to the new one. Um, so there, for example, if we have a tree and the one of our nodes has gone and moved over somewhere else in the tree. So what we'd like in a way is almost like a, a script, like an edit script, um, giving us a list of instructions that we can apply to the old tree to turn it into the new one. And um, React on, originally described this process as diffing, but actually what it does is quite different. So this, this idea, if we have two trees and how can we find an efficient way of getting from one to the other, it sounds like a fairly generic problem that someone studied before. And they have. The only problem is it gets rather slow. Uh, and the, uh, the complexity I would describe as worse than quadratic. The exact, exact complexity factor varies depending on what kind of edits you allow. Because if I have one tree, I have my old tree and my new, you know, my new React component tree. If you allow, depend, you could, depending on, it depends on the kinds of manipulations you allow. So you could, for example, only allow two kinds of manipulation removing nodes and adding nodes. Or you could say, well, I allow moves as well. And depending on what kind of instructions your edit script is allowed to have as to how complicated it will be to work out that set of edits. And so if we implemented that generic uh, tree out, that generic update algorithm, as our UI gets larger, the amount of time it would take to calculate that diff would get very slow and we kind of lose the benefits of, of, of React. Instead, um, what React does is it takes advantage of some domain knowledge about what HTML, you know, how apps are typically structured, what kinds of changes are, to, are going to be likely, and it uses that to speed the process up. The idea being that it won't look for certain kinds of changes which are, un which are, are unlikely, but it might miss some opportunities to say, um, produce the minimal set of edits. So the first major heuristic it uses in this diagram back here, one, the, one of the edits is we've taken a little node down here and we've moved it all the way up here. Uh, the first thing React does, does is says that's unlikely. Um, if I go back to my app here, uh, I click on the tab bar and the component underneath it changes, but it's unlikely that you have a component that moves to a completely different part of the tree. So the first thing we'll do is we won't even bother looking for that. What we'll do instead is we'll work our way down the tree level by level. So we'll start at the top of the app, then we'll go down one level and we'll look for changes under that. So for example, um, let's say I, I click on the tab bar and I, I, I change a tab. Well then the upper part of the app, when we re-render the app, what used to be a details view showing the detail of the current meetup gets replaced with a list of old meetups. Um, that view, that section that shows that view, that will be marked as dirty and that will have changed. So. React won't bother looking any higher up in the tree uh, for any changes. So that simplifies the problem. So we start, we have, a, a, we have our tree um, and we'll, we'll go down each level of the tree. And within each level of the tree, we only need to think about what kinds of changes might have happened in the children of that node between what the old version of the tree and the next. So the next thing is, supposing we've got a, say a list of items and um, We've got our old version of the tree. So maybe here, for example, we had A, B, D, E, and this is our new version of the, this is our new version of the component uh, in which we've added one item, we've removed this one, and these ones have shuffled around slightly. Um, so the, the question is at this point, how much, how much time and effort does it cost to take two lists and diff them to work out what changed? If you use uh, an approach used by the diff tool, for example, or your spell checker is to compute what's called the longest common, common subsequence, which is we look for the sequence of items that occur in the same order in the old and the new, 
and, for example, A, B, and D. They both occur in the same order in the old and the new lists. And then from that, we can see where the gaps appear. So we can see, for example, um, that C has appeared as a new item and E is dropped off the end. Uh, so there is a standard algorithm for this, but again, that has quadratic complexity. And what React does is that, but more importantly, actually working out which of these items are the same would be quite difficult. So say, for example, I have, sorry, this is not very visible here. I'll see if I can zoom in. Oh, it's not going to work very well. Okay, so I've got a, sorry, it's, it's terribly small here, but if you have a, we have a list of buttons. And um, the gist is, if I remove a button from the list, you could view that in one of two ways. I could have taken one element out the list, or I could have taken, say, from wherever I clicked, or I could have taken the bottom element out of the list and then just relabeled all the other ones. So there's two ways of interpreting it. Um, so here, React has noticed when I click on a button, it's gone and removed one element from the list. But it would be quite it it would be quite valid. To, actually, no. Wait a minute. I've got the wrong version up here. Ah, no, got the wrong version. Right. So this. In this list, I haven't given React any hints about the identities of the buttons. So when it takes these items, it doesn't, it doesn't know what, from the old tree to the new tree how the items are related. Um, what React observes is that we can usually give every kind of item in a list some, some unique ID. So if we have a list of tweets, a list of bug reports, um, a list of products, we can usually assign some kind of unique ID to everything in the list. And if we can give every item in the list a unique ID, it becomes a lot simpler. Um, we can, in order to find out what changed between the old and the new list, we can go over every item in the new list and say, did it occur in the old list? Um, if it didn't occur in the old list, it's a new item. If it did occur in the old list, what's its position? And for every item in the old list, is it still there in the new list? If it isn't, then it's been removed. And that's just linear. So it's the cost of however many children there are and more importantly, it can be done very cheaply because we just need to match up the two items having the same key. The next thing is that React knows that we're dealing with a tree of components. Um, and the, the heuristic that it uses is that different kinds of components don't have much in common. So if, for example, I have in my app, I had two views, one showing details of the current meetup and one showing a list of meetups, those are two different components. And so between one version of the component tree and the next, it sees a meetup details component disappear and a, a meetup list component appear. It could dive into those components and try to compare the DOM, sorry, try to compare the, the children of them to see how much, how much the DOM tree had actually, actually changed. But in fact, if the, two comp if the components before and after are different, it doesn't even bother. So if I have a, a calendar, for example, and it ends up getting replaced with uh, a list of tweets, for example, then it wouldn't bother looking for differences. So we start at the top of the tree in our app and we go down uh, reconciling one level at a time. So we're processing each level and within each level, we use the keys of items to find efficiently which items have been removed, added or switched around. Eventually, we come to our react.dom components, which are ultimately what map to the elements that are shown on, that are shown on screen. And if you look through the React code, this is the bit that's littered with comments along the lines of, we've done this in a funny way for performance reasons. This is the most critical part of the code, touch it carefully. And the gist here is, uh, given the old and new props or state for our object, we need to be able to update, uh, update the DOM efficiently. Uh, and the key, uh, the key insight here is that actually accessing the DOM is the relatively expensive part. Uh, mainly because of all the sort of the, the complexity in order for it to be compatible with the web, the DOM, the DOM has a lot of rules and restrictions that, um, that has to apply to it. So, you know, if I maybe access a property, there might be certain rules about what has to be returned, but also anytime you're, anytime you're accessing something on the DOM, you're crossing over from JavaScript into the native browser. And usually whenever you have uh, an application with multiple languages in it, the expensive part is usually at the boundary when you cross over between languages. 
or between run times rather. Um, so the insight here is that actually we can just compare the props and the object from let's say our old react.dom element, the props and state from the new one. And if something hasn't changed, we don't, go bo we don't bother going to look at the actual DOM itself to see what the node on screen is doing. Uh, so for example, um, when I select a tab, it adds an extra, it changes the class name attribute of the react.dom component. And from that, React can see that, yes, that particular attribute changed. But at the style, on the other hand, you can see that that's the same between the, the old tree and the new component tree. So it doesn't even need to go to the DOM. It doesn't need to reach out of JavaScript into C++ to find out uh, what happened or whether to make a change or not. So those, so the combination of going down the tree level by level, uh, using item keys in lists and, uh, and using, using information about the types of components we have, those are the main optimizations that help us uh, diff the tree efficiently. But there are some additional things that happen as well. Uh, so the first is update batching. So if, if something happens in your application, so let's say I, I, you click on a button or something, there may be a whole set of state updates and props changes in response. And some of the ones that come later on might end up replacing the need to do the earlier ones in the first place. So supposing I click on a button and that changes the state of the button, but in response to that click, maybe the whole widget contain or the whole form containing the button disappears. Um, so something a React tries to do, and actually this happens at every level of the browser implementation itself, is to batch these events together. And uh, the way it works by the, the way it works is like this. Uh, so I perform an action. I click on a, a button, for example. Uh, at that point. Um, React will, this will trigger a DOM event in the browser and React will pick up on this. And what React does is it doesn't actually put the event handler on the button itself, for example. Instead, it puts an event handler on the whole document. So if I click anywhere in the React app, that will be picked up by just this one handler. What React will then do is start a batched update and then it will go and dispatch the events to all my, all my handlers in my application. So those handlers might call set state, set props, et cetera. Whilst the batch update is active, any components which get modified don't get reprocessed straight away. Instead, they just get stuck on a list of dirty components that React will need to come and update later. At the end of the event handler, the whole batched update transaction finishes, and then React will then go and re-render re the components that changed. And another observation here to speed things up is that if a component high up in the tree has changed, it's likely to re-render its children anyway. It's not guaranteed, um, but it's likely that if, for example, I, I change the, the whole top level view of my app, then it, components lower down the tree might well be replaced entirely. So we have our list of dirty components and what it does is it sorts them by the depth, they, from the depth, from the, from the root of our application. Uh, so when you create the application, you will call um, react.renderComponent to render the main component for your app into some, div, into some DOM element. So the, that, that top element has a mount depth, it's called, of zero. And it, the next level of components down has a mount depth of one. The next level below that, mount depth of two and so on. So this, this list of dirty components is sorted, and then React will render them, starting with the one at the top of the tree. There are uh, React, that's how React works by default, but actually the way that it batches updates together is pluggable um, because you have a choice to make when, when you batch things together. If you pick a strategy which creates small batches of events, then that means you'll update your UI regularly. So for example, um, you're calling set state to say animate some element, it means that you'll animate the element on a regular basis. But the downside is if you only collect a small number of updates together, uh, you might end up performing unnecessary work on the DOM. On the other hand, you can make the updates much larger. So a really dumb way of doing it would be, I click a button, I set a one second timeout, and I collect all the things that happen in that second, and then I re-render at the end of a second. Uh, so that's very efficient in terms of doing the minimal number of DOM updates. Uh, the <coughs> downside is the UI might not update uh, often enough. Uh, so React comes with two built-in strategies. There's the default one, which starts a batched update at the start of an event handler and finishes it when my event handler returns. 
And there's an alternative one on in the add-ons, uh, React with add-ons, which is based on request animation frame. And what happens there is when you perform a user action, uh, perform an action, so on click or something like that, it starts a batch transaction and it also requests an animation frame. And then all of the events that happen until the animation frame occurs are collected. And then when the animation frame occurs, the entire list is, uh, the entire set of dirty components is processed. So if you're doing anything uh, with animations in React, then, or you're creating a highly animated interface, then that might be a good idea to change, to swap out the default batched update strategy for the one based on request animation frame. At the moment, as far as I can see, you can only switch it around for the whole application. It isn't possible to say, have some components update on one basis and some on another. The last thing you can do is uh, provide uh, react with specific hints about your application works. So if, for example, you have say some props or state, which don't result, which won't result in any visible changes on the screen and won't result in any event handlers being added, you can tell react that for that, if that particular prop changes, um, there's no need to update the component. And the way you can do this is by providing an implementation of should component update. And what this does is it takes, uh, this is a function which will react will call when it updates from the old tree to the new one, and it will provide you with the next set of properties and the next set of state for that component. And you are responsible then for comparing it with the previous state and previous properties. And if it doesn't require an update, you return false and react that will then not bother updating the component or any of the children. So that means that given our tree of react components, you can prune entire chunks from the reconciliation. Uh, and there's also a useful built-in in, again, in the add-ons called React Component with Pure Re Render Mixin. And what that does is it provides a version of Shook Component Update, which does a shallow comparison between all the properties and all of the properties in the next props and all the properties in the state. And if they're the same between two versions of, um, between two versions of the component, uh, then it won't bother updating it. What that means is if you have a component which is pure in the sense of if you give it the same props and the same state, it will always produce the same output, uh, then you can use that mix in and it will make your updates more efficient. Um, just a little bit on how to, on, on observing what React does with the DOM. Uh, so there's a, um, React comes with a useful set of performance tools and um, what they will do is they will tell you uh, well, they will tell you how long React spent processing updates. Um, so what uh, what you do is you have, there are two functions or two perf.start and perf.stop. So in your application, you start um, re recording perform, you start bleh, measuring performance at a certain time by calling perf.start. You do interesting things, you trigger updates to your components and you then call perf.stop. And then you've got a set of functions you can call which will which will print out information to the console about what updates happened, how long they took. And there's also something called print wasted. And what that will do is it will tell you the amount of time that was spent on the diffing or reconciliation process that didn't actually result in any changes. So if a lot of time is being spent in that, it means a lot of effort is going into finding out what changed without anything actually having changed. Uh, so what that looks like, uh, da -da -da -da. There, for example, what I've done is I've added some logging so that every time some states, every time I click on, I do something in my app, it will start, uh, it will start measuring um, updates. And then a second later also, it will stop measuring updates. And then it will print a summary of what changed in the meantime. So there you can see, for example, when I click on a tab, it updated two elements. These two elements, their, their classes changed it removed the old tab, which disappeared, and it replaced it with the new tab. Uh, the other way that you could do this, um, if, you were, if you wanted something to use across frameworks, so if, for example, you were trying to compare how, say, and React and Ember behaved when you performed a certain update, um, there's, a, there's the Mutation Observer API, which uh, you can use to collect records, um, records of the DOM changes that happen in a particular time. Um, so that would be an alternative way of doing it. Uh, some further reading on how React processes updates and what makes it efficient. 
Um, so there's a good article on React's, React's reconciliation algorithm in the docs. And there's also a useful article from an engineer on Facebook's photos team, um, which explains which explains the which explains the, the principles of it. That's me. Any questions? Um, it won't be a stupid question, but, but uh, you mentioned you have this uh, uh, pure um, thing, uh, and you said something about uh, uh, knowing whether to re-render it uh, if the um, like if the state. Uh, but so using that, if the state hasn't changed and the props haven't changed, then you don't need to re-render it. So under, under what circumstances can you need to re-render something if the state and props haven't changed? I'm, I'm sort of not sure what. So if, you if your if your comp here. if your component isn't pure, so if for example you have let's say an object in your state, and then maybe you call a method on that, and you call a method on that, and that act, that returns some value. Um, then if let's say you call set state with the original root object again, and maybe for example, one of the objects in my state is let's call it a service object. Um, and I say set state, this, the, and I say I provide it with a, a service object that hasn't changed. Um, it might at that point, what React can't tell is that you actually you need to go down several levels through that state. So you let's say the state is some object with a method on it that might actually be moves, that might actually return some data that could change between different accesses to it. So maybe if I had a property on my state, which let's say I know, let me access a list of tweets. Um, ideally, if you're writing an idiomat idiomatic React application where let's say um, an idiomatic React application, then if you have two states and two props objects, if every single property is shallow equal, then yeah, um, you know that you won't, you won't need to perform an update. So this is kind of, if you're writing things in the recommended style, um, then yes, you'd have this guarantee. But in practice, of course, if you have, an, if you have a, an application where that's not the case, if you have an application where there are object, there are musical objects under some other object in your state, then you don't have that guarantee. Um, I'm trying to think of a better example to place it. You can get to bother with the states or props. If you have a render function that just does a math or random and renders a black square or a red square. Yeah, but any, anything non deterministic on the props and state, just logic is not really well. That would be a much better example. <laughs> on a similar line, a quick question on how do immutable data structures help with reacts? Like, why, why is it recommended that you use immutable? So the useful thing is if you have, um, so that you can benefit from, so this, well, we have our React, we have an old tree and a new tree and we want to say diff them. The useful thing about uh, an immutable data structure is let's say I have um, an immutable data structure that's sort of tree shaped. And if I make a change at say some low level of the tree, then all the parent elements will have also changed if it's an immutable data structure. Um, and only the leaves that haven't changed will stay this um, will differ. So that means that you can apply that that same kind of thinking here. So um, that means if you had a component, for example, that took that tree as a props or a state or took the root of the tree, uh, if you were using an, immu an immutable data structure, if you make a change down some to some leaf, if you want to make a change to a leaf, uh, what you end up doing is effectively replacing the entire tree. Um, but then you just keep all the nodes from the old tree, which were the same. Uh, so the, I, I would say in, in a sense, the idea is it will compose well with, it will compose well with the, with the way that the, um, if you want to be able to, if you want to be able to take advantage of the ability to prune large chunks of the tree from the re-rendering process, if you're using immutable data structures, that's likely to be easier. So in your case, we're talking about um, the, the engineers by React, we talk a lot about the benefits for the testing, for avoiding regression bugs and things like that. Because if you know that given the same set of props and states, you will always render exactly the same. The GUI rendering is exactly the same way. Then you don't have to worry about things breaking in unexpected ways. Um, 
Yeah. So I would say if you're if you're approaching if you're approaching React, the performance stuff is interesting, but what's likely to be of a first major benefit is the reliability. So the nice thing to think about with React is that uh, this guarantee is this guarantee that yes, it is making things more efficient, but the result is the same as if you'd reloaded the entire application with that state every time. So React is doing things behind the scene to avoid actually doing that. But that's a common thing in functional programming. But let's say when you have an immutable data structure, um, the output or the behavior is the same as if you'd replace the entire list or the entire structure, even though, in fact, behind the scenes, it's optimizing by reusing as much of the old one as possible. Um, so there are also some other uh, variants where it plays in nicely together. So for example, uh, when a component is rendered initially, React will use set in or HTML to dump the whole lot uh, to, to update that whole component. That has two benefits. One, it means that on the server and the client, it's rendering in exactly the same way. Um, but it's also a batching thing because rather than creating a bunch of DOM elements sort of programmatically over JavaScript, instead it creates, a, like say, an entire document, feeds that through to the browser, and then the browser can then efficiently parse the. It can then do a lot of batch work in the browser. Um, because in the browser implementation, it will do things. There's a, there'll be batching of a lot of things in the browser itself. So if you perform a bunch of updates in the browser, that will trigger a reflow. Um, and then, so the browser itself is trying to collect the DOM updates together and not do too many of them. So there's this batching happening in React. There'll be batching happening in the browser and so on. Um, but the, 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 the a slight ham way that the browser is hamstrung is it has to be compatible with content that's already out there on the web. So for example, if I, um, let's say I, I iterate over an HTML collection object. If I mutate the DOM in some way, that has to be reflected if, I'm, if I say, let's suppose I've got an HTML, I've got a list of nodes, um, and I, I ask it how long it is, it will give me an answer. If I add another element to that part of the DOM and ask the list again how many nodes there are, it will have to update itself. Uh, likewise, if I change the style property on, a, on some component and then ask the object, let's say I change the height property of the style, and I ask an object how big it is, uh, at that point, the browser then has to be able to go and give me an up-to-date answer. So one thing that's useful, one thing that React is able to take advantage of through its virtual DOM is being able to throw away a lot of, ignore a lot of legacy baggage. So React DOM elements are quite heavy because, or well, they have a certain weight to them because they've got a lot of properties on them, a lot of things they need to do, a lot of rules they need to respect in order to be compatible with the web. A React element, on the other hand, is a tiny, tiny JavaScript object and it can do that because effectively it's starting with a fresh slate. It's only at the point when React comes to take your DOM tree and then map it to the, so you take your React component tree and map it to the real DOM tree that it has to cross over into that world. Does, does React fetch across uh, multiple group components on a page? And are there other implications if we're using subsets to communicate uh, between component trees? So I haven't seen official documentation on this, but I believe the answer is yes. So I was having a, a look through the, as, as, if, my, as my, if my understanding of the React source code is correct, um, there, is, there is one top level event handler for the whole document. I thought there would be one per root component, but it looks like there's one on the document itself. So that meant, and it's, it's so for, for each type of event, so for a click event, for example, there is one handler on the document for click events and all React components. At least I believe that's the way it works, but I'd have to verify it to be sure. Um, what I would say is it's only within that whilst the event handler is running that the batching occurs. So if I click on a button that issues a network request, that network request comes back very quickly, but still it happens after my event handler is returned. So you then still, that wouldn't then be collected in together together into one batch by default. Um, have you seen anything similar to this in your work on data applications or similar strategies for the like intermediate representation before actual doing a, a re-render of the UI? Uh, no, I haven't. And so things like batching, for example, these other, op uh, let's say, optimizations like batching to event handling and so on, those are things I've seen before. But the concept of re re-rendering the entire UI and then and based on just state and props, that was something that's new. And uh, for the reasons uh, for the reasons he mentioned about the you know being able to conceptually think, I put these inputs into my my state and props input into this and I guarantee to get this output. 
that has a lot of uses and in particular in for certainly for UI testing. Um, UI testing is a painful area of most applications that I've seen. And with React, the idea that you can say um, in Node, you could run your application in Node and it just produces a string of markup. And then you can compare that to what's expected. That's a very nice benefit. So I think the initial idea for React was largely influenced by the rendering engine. So I think in games, they may do this more, but they're obviously aiming for you know, very, very high frame rates. So I think that, that is interesting to reference. I think that's quite free. Or quite free, sorry. I've definitely, where I have seen React described as being more like a game engine is in the sense in the game it. So in traditional frameworks, you have a set of components and then you, you do something, you modify the state of that component. In a game rendering engine, on the other hand, you are re-rendering the entire scene every frame. And because everything's changing every frame, so you need to do that anyway. So uh, that's, that can be described, I've heard it seen it described as uh, is it intermediate, intermediate road rendering? Effectively, that where, where every frame you're re-rendering the entire application. The difference is you just, in React, in React, it's conceptually as if you're doing that. In just practice, it's not actually. Uh, so that's, I think, where the, where, the analogy to, uh, where the analogy to game engines comes in. It's just a, it's a unit of graphics. So that's the old part of the same. Uh, user interface, and this is a unit of and there are one thing I have seen from working on native applications and coming to this and coming to web development is that practices and principles that you need to apply in native applications to make them fast happen on the web as well. So in a you know in my somewhere in my app I needed to have a portion of it that executed extreme that executed um, uh, hashing algorithms extremely fast. I ended up writing C style code in JavaScript to minimize memory allocations and do a bunch of other things that I would in native apps. So in a way, once the apps become of certain level of complexity on the client side, you end up having to adopt a lot of the patterns you would have had in native, native apps as well. But you get the advantage that it runs everywhere. Um, do you mind if I cheaply just explain a little bit about how uh, Ember's batching works? Go for it. So in <laughs> um, does anyone else mind? Like, does anyone mind if I do this really, really quick? I'll, I'll make a mess of it anyway. So Ember has a thing called the, the run loop, which is sort of inherited from native frameworks, particularly ones like, uh, like Coco. And um, it's called the run loop, but really what it means is it's a set of, uh, a set of cubes. So it's like one cube is just changes to simple properties on plain JavaScript objects. And any, if anything in that queue triggers another change on another object, it'll get stuck on that same queue. And that queue has to flush before it gets to the next one, which is the render queue. So if you've got a bunch of objects changing each other and maybe triggering other changes, kind of not necessarily recursively, but sort of having side effects <coughs> on the way, you can guarantee that that will all happen before you go to a rendering stage, which means that if you've got a property which is going to affect the DOM, the render DOM, and actually your change is going to mean it just flips back and then to its original state, the DOM isn't going to get changed and then changed back, so you're not going to pay that cost. So it's, there are actually, I think, maybe five queues, but the conceptually the important thing is it's like all the cheap stuff can happen in one queue that gets flushed completely, entirely, and then you get to the render queue where things can be in the terminology of Ember, coalesce into the smallest set of DOM changes possible. So it's trying to do, it's trying to achieve similar, similar end to React, you know, because as we all realize, touching the DOM is the most expensive part usually in web applications. There's a lot of similarities there. There's lots of things I recognize, and I'm sure that there's lots of scope for joining these things together. But, you know, I, I think. Um, and that concept of doing all the cheap stuff first and doing all the expensive stuff is exactly the same here. There was an idea, um, just in case anyone's interested, there was an idea for a little while floating that Ember might adopt React as its view layer. So Ember has its own view layer at the moment because it manages updating the DOM. And the thought was maybe take the, um, the sort of object system and the router and the kind of higher level parts of Ember. And when it comes to actually doing an update on, on the DOM, it hits React. And React is the 
does the efficient bit for our thing. It didn't happen in the end. Um, there was another strategy put in place in the end of community that's, that got far enough to be competitive with React, but you know, it was a serious possibility for a while. What I have seen a little bit in, uh, in native frameworks sometimes is that you end up having a choice between the expensive, like, a, like you have, say, two button widgets, one that's cheap and one that's expensive. And you, may, you might end up, say, using the light version of a widget in certain contexts where you're going to have a lot of them. And then normally in the UI, you would use the heavy version, um, which is a much less elegant way of solving the problem, really. Oh, thank you very much. And then you have to load it as well. I don't know. It's a big overkill. Unless you have some really complicated application. I don't know. And it's not even backend, right? It's just front end. Thank you. 
I'm serious. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, um, so can I quickly see a show of hands because I, I recognize some of the faces here um, who came along to the Ajax London react event so there's a few there um are there any net porter uh developers in there because there were like four last time including the engineering manager um which might come uh a bit clearer why that's important soon i've toned that down if there are any uh in here okay so um i'm here i'm gonna really be talking about kind of two things one is kind of react obviously and then the other um is why i believe isomorphic web apps or single page apps are, are particularly important but before I get into that, I, I just want to kind of kick off that um, I really think we're in a very exciting time in, in the front end at the moment. Um, certainly when I, I kind of started out um, over a decade ago, uh, it, was, it was definitely the kind of server side that was actually the interesting stuff. Um, you know, you may have used a bit of kind of prototype or, or script delicious if you want to do something a little bit fancy on the front end. But if I look at the kind of state of, of the browser, Nowadays, um, we really are in a, in a kind of second generation browser war. And I mean, it, it's great. Um, you know, performance is clearly going through the roof, not only on, on desktop uh, with Chrome, but uh, they're now very heavily focusing on, on mobile JavaScript performance. You've got uh, Mozilla doing stuff that I still can't quite wrap my head around, uh, given the fact they're taking C and C++ and, and getting almost kind of bare metal performance uh, in the browser. Um, and then if you believe the kind of marketing from, from Apple, then uh, yeah, they're also making some really big uh, gains in, in JavaScript performance. Um, I just want to very briefly mention that uh, also, I mean, hats off to, to IE for, for trying to get back into the game. I think this is kind of great for, for all of us. So with all these kind of performance improvements, why are websites getting slower? Um, and if you need convincing about it, there's uh, this interesting study that Radware and Level 3 do uh, every three months, where they look at the top performance of um, the top 500 e-commerce websites. Um, now, I've worked in a number of startups as well as kind of big companies, and I'm often told, you know, we need graphs up and to the right. Um, <laughs> but this doesn't seem like the right kind of up and to the right, even if, even if the industry is clearly moving in that, that direction. So I think there's kind of three key reasons to why we're seeing websites kind of slow down. If you look at HB Archive um, over that kind of three year period, um, we're clearly kind of doubling or over doubling how much we're shoving uh, down, down the pipe. I think it's also to, uh, important to kind of recognize that um, an awful lot of people now are increasingly using the internet through a mobile connection. And one of the biggest issues with a mobile connection is not um, how much bandwidth. I mean, 4G, you can shove an awful lot down, uh, down the connection, but it's importantly the latency. Um, and finally, I, I think another kind of key reason for this is that we really live in the age of, of single page apps um, where we need to get an awful lot to the browser first before it can start rendering. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against single page apps. Um, I definitely think that they can deliver uh, native like experiences if e executed well. Um, they're often very quick on the next page load times. Um, they also enable us to, to create transient um, or offline uh, web apps as well, which I think are going to be increasingly important in the future. Um, and I think for all of us who, who kind of enjoy working on the front ends, they're, they're definitely kind of more fun to work with than having to jump between uh, stuff on the server and stuff on the client. But how slow is, is too slow? Um, 
So th this is a recent example. Um, so I'm currently doing some consultancy for, for a very large uh, company and we're helping them. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a little afraid to say, but it, it, it's a legacy mean uh, app. Um, and so this was a, a real world example. Um, yeah, recorded over a kind of tethered 3G connection. So what I'm about to kind of show you here is the experience of loading the AngularJS documents. Uh, in the top corner, you'll see the time. Um, and then along the bottom, um, so hopefully you'll be able to kind of see it, you'll see all the resources that the browser is kind of loading in. Okay, so the time has started now. So I'm just going to stop it around kind of two seconds. Um, so at this point, you, you'll see that the browser is desperately trying to give you the best possible experience. It's still showing you the previous page that you're on. Um, and that's even though if I kind of scroll up here, if you look at the bottom, we've already actually loaded quite a bit. So the page loaded very quickly, even though it's a, a slow connection. We've loaded uh, what's that, kind of five CSS documents to now we're starting to kind of pull in the kind of core JavaScript app there. So if I kind of start the timer again so we can continue on now we're just about to get oh, slightly too early so we're now kind of 10 well almost 11 seconds in so we can see that the, the bulk of the javascript has has loaded now um but we still haven't got the actual content uh that i was after i have to kind of wait another two seconds uh before the, the, the content and then finally the, the, the kind of fonts uh, are pulled in. Now, this might be kind of a, a bit of a, an extreme example, but um, like there are definitely users out there experiencing that. Um, so perhaps there's, there's kind of another way of, of delivering this to, to users that, that uh, can dramatically improve the experience. Um, and so, well, the, the term is is sometimes called isomorphic, but it is really about bringing some of that rendering um, that's now purely going on in the client back to the server. As a kind of luckily, Airbnb uh, kind of coined this term, uh, I think a bit over a year ago now. Um, now, I, I do need to kind of put this with a, with a little bit of a kind of warning that. I think it's kind of well known to all of us that, that naming things in computer science is just a hard problem. Um, and it certainly kind of made some people very upset on, on Hacker News. Uh, so just be kind of careful if, if you're using this term, particularly around kind of people who uh, enjoy maths. <laughs> OK, so a few weeks after kind of Airbnb um, kind of coined this, this term and we're kind of trying to push their, their framework, um, Facebook decided to kind of unravel or uh, um, unveil, sorry, uh, a framework that uh, I think they've been working on for at least uh, a year and a half, two years internally. Um, and so we've already had kind of a bit of an intro as so I'll, I'll kind of skim through this kind of uh, fairly quickly, but React really kind of breaks down into two core components, the virtual DOM, which we've, we've just heard in kind of a lot of detail and then the kind of components that actually build up your, your view. Now there is a kind of third, and I need to kind of make this really clear that this is optional and we'll see some examples uh, where you really don't need to use JSX. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll come on to that kind of later. So uh, we've already seen quite a bit of code, so I'll, I'll just kind of skim through this. So this is perhaps kind of one of the, the simplest uh, components that you can create. So in this case, uh, this is just a, a hard coded uh, comment box. Uh, if we want to render that on the page, it's, it's really simple. We, we just pass it into this React render component and then the actual element that we want to, to inject that into in the DOM. If we wanted to make this kind of a bit more uh, complex, then uh, in this case, we've introduced these, these properties. So both for kind of author and in this case, we're deciding to use kind of children rather than have a, um, a separate kind of uh, text property there. And the, the piece along the bottom, you can see how we're kind of injecting that into that comment. If we wanted to kind of build a kind of hierarchy of components, this is how we would build kind of a conversation that in this case is mapping over um, uh, an array of, of comment um, objects that we pass in. Now, kind of I mentioned JSX earlier. So if we wanted to, to kind of tidy up some of this, uh, 
well, relatively verbose JavaScript, um, then we can conveniently use uh, an XML-like uh, syntax. Um, so I, I'm personally, if, if we're just working with kind of pure JavaScript uh, and we've got people who are, tend to be more on the kind of HTML and CSS end of the spectrum, then this is definitely kind of a much easier way of getting them kind of involved in, in a way where they can edit and modify the, the code without um, being too daunted by it being JavaScript based. Um, but again, if you want to go down the ES6 route, then you can actually create syntax that's that feels very similar uh, in, in succinctness, but, but is still kind of pure JavaScript. Um, it's also worth kind of mentioning um, that you can create very elegant code with, with things like coffee scripts. And as I know some of you know, I'm a massive fan of, of closure script. So um, if, if you enjoy kind of Lisp, uh, then there's an awesome framework called Ohm, which, which actually goes um, kind of way beyond in, in terms of its ability to identify where changes are. Um, often in benchmarks, actually, you'll, you'll see that kind of Ohm is comes out quicker than, than React itself because of those mutable collections that are, are so fundamental to closure. Okay, so so how about uh, making this kind of interact? So th this is an example of, of adding kind of an on submit handler. Um, now, in this case, we'll see that we're actually passing in a, a function with the create comment um, property here. So this uh, comment form, for example, could be embedded in this comment box like this. And now we can start to see where we're introducing a concept of, of state. Now, um, there's something kind of relatively subtle here, which I kind of want to point out, which, which I think is kind of awesome about, again, creating really uh, responsive um, user interfaces. So um, in this particular example, um, where we're optimistically rendering the comment that someone has posted. Um, you can see that we're updating the, the state here near the bottom. We then make the post to the API, um, which in this example, let's just say that the API is returning all of the, the comments. Uh, we can not only kind of show something much, much quicker to, to the user, um, but in many cases, you may not actually need to, to update the, um, the UI at all. Again, I'll have kind of a, an example of that working in a moment. So uh, if you don't mind, because it's quite late, I'm going to skip the virtual DOM because I think we've heard quite a bit of that already. Um, now, this is this is a talk about kind of isomorphic web apps. Um, so kind of what's the difference then between the, the, the first kind of widget that we saw with the render component um, and a server side version? Well. Luckily, it's incredibly uh, simple. In, in this case, we just use a, a different function with exactly the same kind of widgets. Uh, and, and now we get, get a string that we can return back as part of that HTTP response. Now I'm going to kind of gloss over this. Uh, again, we, we heard about kind of a great um, framework. Um, we actually kind of believe that uh, we, we need a kind of specialized uh, DSL for that. Um, so that's, that's part of this kind of new, new products that we're working on. Um, again, we're going to kind of skip that uh, for now. Um, okay, so uh, how about kind of a demo as to how much of a difference this, this kind of really makes? So um, the, the reason I was a bit uh, kind of anxious about uh, whether there's any net supported developers in, in the room is that um, on this study that um, Level 3 and Radware did, uh, we thought it would be kind of fun to pick on the site that's 100 milliseconds quicker than Amazon because you know, Amazon is renowned for, for quoting how much kind of difference uh, 100 milliseconds kind of makes. Uh, I also thought I was picking on an American online store because they were selling sneakers. Uh, as I say, I didn't quite appreciate that um, this scraped version of their site um, called Mr. Portly. Uh, yeah. So let's just quickly cut to, to an example of that. Um, so I mean, I, I don't really kind of want to spend sort of too much time sort of clicking around here, but hopefully you can sort of see that if I kind of refresh the page, we're getting quite a, a quick kind of load time there. And if you want to see the same kind of video that, that we had for the, the Angular app, 
So again, this is on, I just need to kind of highlight, this is on a, a, a throttled 3G connection. Um, so already, uh, well, kind of less than a second in, we've both got the, the kind of HTML, CSS. Now, in this particular example, this is very image heavy, so it's not quite a kind of like for like comparison. But if we'd had the kind of content in there, at this point, you could already start kind of reading your, your documentation, say. Um, now, there's a kind of really important sort of line to sort of point out here if I scroll back up. Now, at this point, again, we can see the kind of key blue line here that hopefully you're, you're all familiar with if you've looked um, at the typical kind of Chrome inspector. At this point, JavaScript has not loaded. That's that orange bar along, along the bottom. So everything we're presenting here, again, on this kind of slow uh, connection is able to be rendered by the browser um, without any JavaScript involved at all. So it's only kind of when we get, um, you know, sort of four, four seconds in or so that uh, at this point, the JavaScript will have kicked in. In fact, you can actually see the, the kind of loading kicking in there. Like, well, just about see that at the top there uh, being pulled in. And then finally, you know, it's about six and a bit seconds in the entire page, uh, along with the kind of 60 images or so has loaded. So if you want to see what this is in, in kind of comparison, uh, so this is using kind of web page test, which is kind of a great uh, tool. Yeah, and they're, they're not kind of quite fair uh, comparisons. I was told that I did pick on the, the, the slowest page actually on, on their site. So it was a bit kind of unfair there. Um, but well, yeah, so I mean, ho hopefully I kind of convince you that, that you can make a big, big difference there in, in terms of the kind of performance. Now, there are some, some other kind of nice things that you can do once you kind of move to this kind of model. So, so one, I think YouTube um, was certainly the kind of first that um, came along and introduced this, uh, is reintroducing some sort of progress bar to give the indication to users that the, the page is loading. You may also have kind of seen something very similar on, on sites like Medium. Um, there's another really good trick that you can do. Um, which is to, to replace the what you often see, particularly with, with jQuery websites, is to wait for, um, well, typically now in a modern browser, it'll be the DOM content loaded uh, before you start executing your JavaScript. Uh, on older browsers, it will be the, the, the red line because they don't fire the first event. And what you can do is actually kind of completely replace this with a technique that you have um, similar to, to Google Analytics. So again, I've got kind of another example of this. So this is a half finished dashboard that we're working on for, for this, this new product. So you can see this, this is built in, in React. Um, if I now log in, so we can see that that will have refreshed the page. In fact, let's bring this out. So I don't know whether any of you have seen the new, um, so th this was in Canary for, for a long time, but now uh, in, the, in the standard release of Chrome, they've introduced this, this really um, cool tool for, for simulating network connections. So let's just say kind of, I want to simulate this on an edge connection, which is obviously very, uh, very, very slow. So if I refresh the page, so again, we're using the kind of same trick here where um, the HTML is delivered has rendered out the entire page. If I now start clicking around, um, so you can see, yeah, it's kind of very, very responsive, even though it's uh, kind of having to load in some content in there. If I click back to here, and this, this may be a bit too quick to notice even on this connection. So I'm actually rendering the previous applications because we have them cached in memory already. Um, and then as the network response comes back, so if we ignore the Google Analytics. So if I, so as I click around here, then you can see that the kind of API call coming in kind of much later. Um, so that's just kind of one quick example about how we can uh, sort of dramatically improve the uh, the, the performance of, of user experience. Okay, so summing up then, um, browsers are faster than they've ever been. Um, I suppose all I can plead to, to uh, 
people who are building products that I'm certainly using on the web. Don't waste it. Talks kind of a lot about uh, the, the benefits of uh, isomorphic web apps. So I didn't really touch on, on how you can reuse kind of a lot of code with this, this technique. I didn't talk at all about kind of how um, you, you basically solve your SEO problems with this if you go down this route and, and uh, care about search engines. Um, but the, the performance really can deliver a completely different experience. And one that we're kind of big believers in that this can actually create better than native experiences. Um, so we've heard a lot about kind of React. So thanks. If you could have, um, so if, if the page is, you mentioned that if the page is being delivered and the user's whilst it's still HTML and the JavaScript has loaded and you trigger events, what happens then? So it's kind of, that's an interesting uh, question. So, um, um, maybe we can kind of go back to. So if I click on some of those flows whilst the page is still being downloaded, would it? Would yeah. So in, in that case, in that instance, um, it would you link stuff up properly, so it would request another page. Um, I suppose the kind of hope is we haven't enabled that on any of these demos, uh, but a fundamental bit of our technology is to leverage Speedy in HTTP two. Um, so we should be able to kind of deliver the JavaScript that you'll use and then the, the next page. So, so there'll the be a small still, pause, but the links and the critical the search would still work even if the JavaScript content was correct. Yeah, I mean there obviously would be some things. So for example, uh, if I jump out of this. So if I go back to kind of our example UI here. Um, so in this case, we're kind of clicking between pictures your kind of gravatar which one you want to use like that that wouldn't work but um yeah I, I suppose you know we gracefully fall back if you write the html correctly Given that as as connections get faster like 4g has much better latency than speed uh, and reasonably within reason um do you think that i that doing this kind of like you know rendering stuff on the server first and then on the cloud you know the, the whole arsenal do you think that will continue to be important even as connections get faster and better? Yeah, so we're seeing, so one of these kind of big uh, customers that I'm working with at the moment, um, so we're in the process of spinning up, I probably shouldn't say, but many data centers around the kind of globe um, because they, they want to move off um, some well-known kind of cloud uh, providers. Um, and one thing that's really interesting there with the kind of dashboards that helps kind of control these things, that's hosted in one location at the moment. Um, and they have literally hundreds of development teams around the globe, including in China, which is a massive market for them. Um, and the latency from there is, is horrific, um, particularly for this, this mean stack initial implementation that they've done. And it's partly because of the way in which Angular particularly like is very, very chatty with pulling in resources. Um, now we think we can give some quite big improvements in speed, uh, with some very smart um work with with http2 because you basically preemptively shove everything that's about to ask um but that's not a simple problem to solve so so latency will always stay terrible is that well i mean just, when you're talking about like china uh, accessing data centers in in the uk say i mean you're bound by the speed of light which is kind of yeah but it is quite, it, it is quite fast, but this stuff really does add up. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially again, your typical kind of Angular app. Um, it's, it's kind of easy to be myopic in the, in the West in the sense of we're, we're in the middle of London, we have a great internet connection, we're sitting at the best all the time, but it's easy to forget this enormous number of users or possible users of all of stuff out there who have been Android or many more numerous than us. The speed of light is not actually as fast as you may think if you're accessing something around the globe. I mean, there are hopefully other kind of benefits you're seeing there. I mean, you're, um, SEO is still quite a big deal. I know Google is able to index part of JavaScript, but it also ranks how quickly you get an experience to someone. Um, also, I mean, there are people like DuckDuckGo and things like that. So, um, yeah. Also, I guess. 
and the refresh still has a slight boot. So <clears> the, uh, yeah, so if I disable JavaScript, yeah, you'll still. And, and you probably don't notice anything in any behavior. Well, so in this, you obviously, yeah, st stuff would stop working in, in parts of it, but. When was the last time you used an advisor to JavaScript? Well, mm -hmm. uh, you said, but. Just any we, network errors. We've, um, you know, we've been writing single page apps for some time. And where the parse time, the parse time for JavaScript, so not the download time, you can do it that much for those two, but the parse time for JavaScript on an iPhone 3 GS or something like that, or an iPhone 4, it's prohibitive for you know, a big chunk of the web. And it only takes one error as well uh, in parsing that to completely shaft your, your yeah. whole app. And so, what we found is that by turning JavaScript off, you actually improve my source of I mean, it's like a weird thing that we like. Press enhancement, right? JavaScript enhances rather than um, detracts from your experience. But on, 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 you know, it's we haven't we haven't had like fast JavaScript engines for that long. You know, we've, we feel like we have because we've been using them a lot recently. But like you go back a few years, and, and you know, uh, I six, seven, eight, they're awful, like, really slow, and. And if you're in a, in a good isomorphic application that's, that's got server side groups for everything anyway, because it can be rendered on the server all the time. So um, you turn JavaScript off, everything has a working because there's a round trip in the front. But that round trip is faster than parsing the JavaScript. So there's many questions for, for both of you guys, but if you um, rendering on both client and server, if you've got different parts of an application which are, are making asynchronous requests to your data, what's the what's the rules of thumb for dealing with that and make sure that it you know it works just fine on the server and you don't have to think too much about maybe not making some of those requests or making sure they're finished before you respond? Uh, so it's an interesting question. Again, we, we think you need a DSL to do it as fast as we are aiming to get. Um, so this is kind of a little bit early to talk about it too much, but I mean, it, it should feel a bit like Nginx configuration. It should feel a bit like um, ES6. Um, so on the server, we're actually compiling this down to lure JIT because um, we want to deal with large scale kind of websites and many, many apps. Um, and then in on the JavaScript side, uh, it's currently compiling down, so these kind of go-like syntax, um, it's compiling down to, to uh, promises underneath. So, um, yeah, all we care about is not giving you something so expressive that you can make bad mistakes with your routing, but it should feel familiar enough that it's JavaScript or an Nginx config or something like that. Um, if you want to make those other calls, then you make those other calls when, when you need to. What do you call it? Uh, so this is being called Mux, but again, we're so we're open sourcing kind of as much as we as much as we can. Uh, there's still quite a bit of work to do, so it's probably the start of next year before we're properly letting people on. Um, it's quite a bit of work, and yeah. What's what would your last advice to? Once we all of that um, asynchronous and asynchronous style. So it sounds like everyone is as tired as I am. <laughs> thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks, Marcus. Yeah. Awesome. Um, if anybody wants to talk next month, um, I think we've still got a slot, I think. How many slots have we got next month? Um, Open still. One, two, maybe? Yeah, so please um, get involved and talk. Um, what else do I need to say? Go by your hive. <laughs> There's plenty of beer left and pizza and um, the time. For, and Dark this year, are you going to say anything? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks for coming, guys and girls. Cheers. Thank you.